How do you handle the ups and downs of life? They're going to come. There will be ups and there will be downs. And the interesting thing is that everybody is not the same place at the same time. And what we need is each other. Let me begin by just pointing out that in life we experience ups and downs. I mean, that's obvious it should be, but let me give you some scriptural undergirding for that. Ecclesiastes, you remember, read a moment ago, enjoy prosperity while you can, but when hard times strike, realize that both come from God. Hard times and good times. That way you'll realize that nothing is certain in this life. And you remember Job who encountered so many terrible, terrible difficulties. His wife wanted to give him some advice. Listen, his wife said to him, are Job, are you still trying to maintain your integrity? Just curse God and die. But Job replied, you talk like a godless woman. Should we accept only good things from the hand of God and never anything bad? So in all of this, Job said nothing wrong. I mean, he had his finger on the pulse. He knew that there'd be both good and bad, and we didn't need to blame God one or the other. Now, ups and downs are going to come. When you look at a glass, you can either see it half full or half empty. When you look at life and you see things, it's not the circumstances that determine our happiness. It's how we respond to them. It's how we look at them. Uh, let me just take the piano here for a moment. You heard some beautiful music a moment ago. I mean, Fran and Wilburn played marvelously. Let me see if I can do what they did. You know, there's something wrong with this piano. <laughs> that piano just doesn't produce the way it did for them. Now, let me ask you a question. Is the problem with the piano or is it the person sitting there? I've heard a resounding no. <laughs> You see, in life, two people can experience the same circumstance. One finds joy and the other becomes depressed. One curses God and one thanks God. You see, it's not the instrument, it's the person who is responding to the instrument. Now today, I want you to realize it's not the circumstances. Most of us have very, very little control over the circumstances. What's going to happen this year, we don't have much control over how we respond to them, how we look at circumstances will determine how effectively life is. We're looking at life at a better level. Life at 2.0, a better version. We're going to move up. As Wesley said, we want to move up towards perfection. And you've got to know how to handle ups and downs of life. So let me begin with the successes. Let me confess to you that successes sometimes might be tougher to handle than failures. And when I look at this congregation and us in Montgomery, we're successful people. We're a blessed people. We need to know how to handle those successes very well. Uh, Michael Douglas, the actor, had five blockbuster movies. His father, Kirk Douglas, wrote him a note and said simply this, I am more proud the way you handle success than your success. And Douglas said he saved the note. It's one of the most important he ever received. I was convicted this past week. I was reading an article about Somerset Maughan. When he died in 1978, Time Magazine declared him the most successful, famous author in the world. Success. 80 million books sold. 80 of his stories adapted for television. And the list goes on and on. He entertained royalty from around the world. He had a lavish house on the Riviera. Everything that you would identify as success, Somerset Moan had, even declared the most successful, famous author in the world. But he was an unhappy man. And somebody asked him just before he died, what is wrong? And this is what he said. What is wrong is my success. My success means nothing to me. All I can think of now are my mistakes. I wish I'd never written a single word. My writing has brought me nothing but misery. Now, how could a man so famous not know how to handle success? I've heard my dad say oftentimes, it's difficult to hold a full cup with a steady hand, especially if that cup was filled quickly. And I've seen a lot of folks who can't handle success. The more we get, the worse we become. Let me give you three practical examples from Scripture. 
How do you handle the ups, the successes, and the blessings of life? Number one, we must give God thanks and recognize his blessing. You got to begin by saying, hey, I didn't do this. God did it. God, I want to thank you. I have been blessed. In Proverbs, the wise writer said, a man is tested by the praise he receives. Somebody becomes successful and they become arrogant and hard to live with. Some people become successful and they're more grateful to God and they are praised by people. In Deuteronomy, Moses said, I want to remind you, the power and strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. You're wrong. Remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth. And when we begin to think about where we are, we begin to think about, look what I've accomplished. Read what the psalmist David said. Remember the Lord and praise him. Never forget the good things he does for me. And then he does this litany. Look what God's done for me. He forgives. He heals my diseases. He ransoms. He surrounds me with love and tender mercies. He fills my life with good things. So we've got to start. When I have any success, it's not what I've done. Father, thank you. You've blessed me. Now, the second step is not only to thank God, but then to see ourselves as channels through which God's blessings flow. Let me tell you why God gives us blessings. We're blessed in order that we can become a blessing. God gives to us in order that we might become a conduit or a channel through which his love can flow. That's why Peter said, cheerfully share your home with those who need a meal or a place to stay. Now, God's given gifts to each of you from his great variety. Manage them so that God's generosity can flow through you. Now, that's a concept of who I am. That's the way to look at life. I am now becoming a channel through which God's love is going to flow. And then Paul says to Timothy, Tell the people to use their money to do good. They should be rich and good works should give generously to those in need and always ready to share with others whatever God has given them. Why does God bless us financially and offer us to have more or in order for us to give more? My blessing, my success, my ups in life come because God's given it to me and he wants to use me as a channel for others. The wealthiest man, they say, that ever lived was the great ruler in about 900 uh, A.D. His name was Charlemagne. I mean, he had more than you could ever imagine. He ruled the world. When he died, they put him in a huge tomb about as big as this side of the church over here. They made a huge throne out of solid gold, and they laced it with diamonds and rubies and emeralds. They put a long cape on him, and it was solid gold. They filled that whole room with the riches that he had accumulated. And they sealed it. And you remember, they found the tomb and it was opened some time ago. When it was, they were shocked to find all of that gold had tarnished. And there was a skeleton sitting on the throne. But on the skeleton's knee, there was a Bible. And it was open to Matthew 16, 26 that somebody had put into his tomb and that verse says, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world but loses his own soul? What does it profit you and me to be so successful if in becoming successful we lose our own souls? God blesses me God blesses you, and every blessing is in order that we might be a blessing to others. So I thank God for it. I ask him, how do you want to use me through which it can be a channel? And the third thing, I just have to decide sometimes when is enough enough? One of the biggest questions Americans have trouble with, when is enough enough? Look what Timothy said. You want to be content? Let me tell you where contentment comes. If godliness and you have contentment, you brought nothing into this world, you're not going to take anything out of it. And as long as you have food and clothing, can we be content with that? We're caught up in a rat race of, I got to get more. When is enough enough? And when do we enjoy contentment? We came into this world with nothing. 
We go out of this world with nothing. And this world sort of becomes a test of why we understand God's blessings and how they're used. I heard a cute story recently about a very wealthy man in a community. He was elderly, he was sick, he was about to die. He called in the Catholic priest the Baptist preacher and the Methodist preacher and said, I respect you men of God. And he said, I've made a lot of money and I want to take some of it with me when I die. Would you be willing to help me? I want to give each of you $100,000 and when I die, would you just come and place that money in the casket? I want to trust you. Can't trust my family. I want to trust you. Would you put the money in the casket? He said, sure. Well, the man died not long after that. And each of the three pastors was given a moment at the funeral home alone with the casket and the dead man. Each of them went in and spent a little time. They had the funeral. The next day, the priest and the preachers got together, and they were all wondering, I wonder if that guy did what he was supposed to do. And they looked at the priest, and he said, Hey, I want to confess to you. My parish, we desperately needed a van. And he can't use that money anyway, so out of the $100,000, I kept $25,000 from a parish. I just put in $75,000. Then the Baptist preacher had a smirkish grin on his face, and they said, what did you do? He said, well, we're in a building project. My church needs it worse than he does. Uh, I just put in $50,000, and I kept $50,000 for the church. The Lord needed it. Then they looked at the Methodist preacher, and what did you do? He said, I'm ashamed of you fellows. I thought that man said he could trust us. And I figured you wouldn't do what you really said you would do. So I just put in a check for $200,000 to cover you. We didn't come in with anything. We're not going to go out with anything. And we sit and we rationalize. I want more. When is enough enough? Hebrews, be satisfied with what you have for God has said, I will never, never forsake you. When am I going to be content? When will you be content with what you have? Success. Interestingly, the word success is only used one time in the Bible. One time. It's in the book of Joshua, first chapter. What does the world call success? There are five words that they tell us that if you're successful in the world, it deals with money, Power, authority, control, and position. One time the Bible uses the word success, it doesn't mention any one of those five words. You know what it says? The successful man is the one who looks neither to the left nor the right, but walks in the way of the Lord. Success. It's not in just getting. Success is walking in the way of the Lord. How do I handle it? Thank him for it. How's he going to use me to be a conduit? And how can I determine when enough is enough? How do you handle success? Now, let me go back and say, I've seen a lot of folks that can handle failure better than success. I've seen marriages split apart because people became more successful. I've seen people lose touch with their friends because they've become so successful. It's tough. These are some suggestions. Now, the other point. How can we handle disappointment, tragedy, and failures? How can we handle the downs of life? How can we deal with failure? Now, I grant you it's going to come. You're not going to succeed at everything. The greatest hitters in baseball don't bat a thousand. The greatest home run hitter didn't hit a home run every time. You're going to have failures. And you don't ever really know what success is till you've had failure. That's the only way you can really recognize success. How do we handle it? First, number one, in a time of failure, a tough time, a disappointment, a tragedy, we must turn to the Lord for strength and help and hope. All of our music this morning is centered around that. Turn to Him. Trust in Him. He's my friend. He's my foundation. I must trust in Him. Uh, 1 Samuel 30. Would you just read that this afternoon? For me, one of the most fascinating stories in the Old Testament. It illustrates this point so well. You see, David 
had taken his army of 600 men back to Ziglag, that was their home camp. When they got there, they discovered that the Amalekites had come in and had ravaged the village, had stolen all of their children and wives and everything that they owned. They'd pilfered it and they'd run off. And when the men came back and saw that, they were disappointed, a tragedy, terrible. So what did they do? They looked at David and they said, it's your fault. And you read that verse there in the sixth verse, it says, they took out stones and they started to stone him. Now here's the leader. These people are depressed and they're going to stone him to death. What does David do? What's the way, how do you handle a tough time? How do you handle a tragedy? It says, David found strength in the Lord his God. When you get to the end of your rope, tie a knot and trust God and hang on, and something good will come from it. In fact, let me read on in that story. Uh, all of a sudden, David rallied the troops. They decided to go after the Amalekites. They came to a big stream, and 200 of his 600 men said, man, we're exhausted. We can't go on any further. David said, well, just sit down then. We'll go without you. The 400 went on. They found the Amalekites. They were able to go to battle with them and they killed all of the Amalekites. Every child, every wife, every animal, everything they had stolen was there intact. And David and his men pick up all the stuff that the enemy had stolen and they start back home. Now when they get back to the creek, guess who they meet? The 200 that had quit. What do you think they said? Uh, would you check and see if you got my stuff back? And they said, wait a minute, you didn't go to battle. You don't get it back. See that success? Success sometimes leads to selfishness. I mean, hey, it's not yours. You don't deserve it. You didn't go to battle. What did David do? He went to the Lord, and the Lord said this. Everybody should have everything that they ever lost. And all of the things that had been plundered were given back every child, every animal, every valuable thing, every, every person receded. Where did David find how to do that? He trusted in the Lord. Now, it doesn't matter if you're successful or if you're at the bottom rung. David turned to the Lord, and the Lord heard him and answered him. Look what Jesus said in Matthew 11. Come to me. If you're heavy and weary and burdened, I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. I, I, I'm your person. In tough times when you're down, we must turn to the Lord for strength and help and hope. And here's a promise from John 16. In this world, you're going to have some downs. In this world, you're going to have some tragedies and defeats. But be a good cheer. I have overcome the world. Like with our successes, our failures. We turn to trust in God. Secondly, we reach out to others. We're in this together. Now listen carefully. You can't handle it by yourself. Not a one of us is capable psychologically or mentally or spiritually to handle that by ourselves. We need the help of each other. That's why we're a church. That's why we're a family. We reach out to each other. In Galatians 6, Paul said, look, if somebody is overtaken, you who are brothers, go to that person. He said, share each other's troubles and problems, and in this way we obey the law of Christ. What happens on Sunday morning? When you sit in your pew, you don't know what the person next to you is handling. You don't know what kind of agenda they brought to this service of worship. And you might be on the mountaintop, and they might be in the valley. We need first to reach out, but when we're down, we also need to say, I need help. And sometimes that's hard for us. We need each other in order that we might share each other's troubles and in this way obey the law of Christ. Paul wrote to the Corinthians, he said, he comforts us in all troubles in order that we might comfort others. And when others are troubled, we'll be able to give them the same comfort that God gave to us. How much do we care for each other? We live in a world that's so selfish. Man, if I've got it together, don't bother me. 
But I need to be able to ask. And I need to be a part of a family where what we've received, we're ready to give. And the comfort God's given to us, we give to each other. Uh, the young people told me a cute story about a couple of guys who were out on a hiking trail. And they looked up and they saw a female bear that had been disturbed, a grizzly. She had been protecting her, her cubs. And he, she thought they were after him. And so she took out after these two hikers. Uh, immediately, one of them stopped and said, hey, I'm going to put on my tennis shoes. And he starts putting on his tennis shoes. His buddy said, man, why are you putting on tennis shoes? Uh, that bear can run 35 miles an hour. He can crush you with just, why are you putting on your tennis shoes? You can't outrun that bear. He said, I ain't got to outrun that bear. All I got to do is outrun you. <laughs> now, sadly in life, that's the approach many folks take. Hey, I'm not worried about all. Hey, all I got to do is do better than you. I'm going to let you take the fall. How do you handle a failure, the downers of life? We must reach out to each other. And then the last thing, we must trust that God can use even the most difficult and painful things in our lives for good. Do you believe that? Job did. In fact, Romans 8, 28 is a verse to live by. We know, we know that God causes all things to work together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Are you willing to say, now God, I don't understand why this happened, but, but tell me, what are you going to teach me in it? And what are you going to use in this to make me a different person? And how are you going to use this situation, which might even become a platform for ministry for me? That's how God wants to use those tough times, the down times of life. And in James 1, he says, look, brothers and sisters, whenever trouble comes, let it be an opportunity for joy. And then he talks about faith and endurance and growth. It means that God begins to move us forward. So how do you handle tough times? When the dis and they're going to come this year. I don't know when. I can grant you they're coming. How do you handle it? You've got to turn to the Lord and trust in Him. You've got to turn to brothers and sisters in Christ, a church family. And you've got to ask the question, Lord, how are you going to use this situation and in using this situation to make me what you want me to be. We have a great study on Wednesday night for men. We're studying a great little book. Mark Batterson wrote it. It's about being in a pit with a lion on a snowy day. Uh, this weekend's made it a little bit more real with the snow, and, and the lesson this next week's going to deal with that. I'll conclude with this quote that he makes. God wants you to get where God wants you to go more then you want to get where God wants you to go. Do you realize God wants more for your life to move up to 2.0 even than you do? Do you realize that God wants even more to move you where he wants you and me to be even than we do? How do you look at life? I can promise you, I can guarantee you, there'll be some ups and there'll be some downs. But you got to look at it his way and you've got to realize what he wants. One of the great religious leaders in the last generation was Bishop Ralph Spalding Cushman. He, he sort of went through life until his son Jim became a missionary. And as a missionary, he came to an untimely death. And Bishop Cushman wrote these words. And boy, it's about how we look at life and our values. He wrote, I counted dollars but God counted crosses. I counted gains, but he counted losses. I counted my worth by the things gained in store, but he sized me up by the scars that I bore. I coveted honors and sought for degrees. He wept as he counted the hours on my knees. And I never knew till one day by our grave how vain are the things that we spend life to save. I did not yet know until Jim went above, the richest is he who is rich in God's love. Genuine success, genuine wealth is when we're wealthy in his way. The successful man is one who doesn't look to the left nor to the right, but walks in the way of the Lord.
2008. How are you going to handle your successes? Your failures? Here are at least some suggestions from Scripture to start. When you're successful, thank God for it. You didn't do it. He did it. How does he want you to share it with somebody else? And when is enough going to be enough? Or are we going to kill ourselves trying to be more successful? And on the other side, you're going to have some failures. You're going to be some downers. What are you going to do then? Trust in the Lord. Reach out to fellow people. And ask yourself the question, God, how are you going to use this? to grow me to a better version, to move on toward perfection, as Mr. Wesley said. How are you? The piano is not the problem. Life circumstances are not the problem. It's the person who is responding to it. Father, this year, every person will face some ups some downs, some successes, some failures, some blessings, some disappointments. Oh God, may we just learn to handle them right now. Maybe some person watching on television or listening on the radio, us, we are sitting here. What commitment does God want you and me to make so that this year we can handle the successes and failures as godly people who grow and whom God can use in a better way. God, give each of us the courage to make those kind of decisions. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.